Jack Parsons got me on the moon. Jack Parsons got me on the moon. Good evening, wherever you are, whoever you are, whatever you are, uh, in some cases. Welcome to the Velocity of Now, New Year's Eve 2023, going into 2024 special. Now, we were planning with Sarah on Hocus Focus to do an end of year 40 in review, but she was burnt out after doing that Herculean task of putting that fantastic a Christmas special together, over four and hours worth of it, and uh, so it was unfair for her to expect her to do this again for a Hocus Focus special. So we came to the agreement that I would do it as a VON instead. So basically tonight will be a 40 in review of the year, with a bit of banter and a few other things that will bring us over from the, the start, the end of a very strange year, and the beginning of what I think will be an even stranger and more mind-blowing year. I don't know why I feel that way. I just do. So I hope you're all keeping well. You're listening to me here on the Beyond Room 313 channel. And uh, I hope you had a lovely Christmas. It sounds like most people have had a very enjoyable Christmas. Nice and relaxing, and that's the way you want it. And it's good to see more and more people moving away from the commercialization of this season and getting more into a kind of a internal you know introspection which is what it's supposed to be with what it was for our ancestors and we seem to be going that way i always find that those that week between christmas day and new year's day to be a kind of a good time for art and reading and that kind of relaxation thing going on so hopefully you've been doing some of that in terms of fortiana it's been a remarkable year in terms of lots of things, I mean, Sarah and I have covered so much on Hocus Focus. And it's it's now part of reality. If You you know, it, there used to be a thing where the, the, stre the high strangeness of the world, the paranormal, the Fortean, uh, the hauntology, and that's played a huge part in this, it stood apart from day-to-day -day life. It stood apart from you know what we call normal life or the normal everyday world but now the veil has melted so much and i don't mean that in a the kind of a new agey way that the, the veil has melted i mean in a kind of a consciousness way that those of us who you know are in these tribes or these kind of like-minded people generally we rejected the needle craft the prickly pear and we've maintained all our cognitive faculties which allows us that sense of deep introspection and wonder that brings forth, you know, not only the, the interest in these topics, but also things like art. 
and an appreciation of art and literature and things like that. And it's the funniest thing how, like, the hauntology, the whole hauntology of the field, the sensation that's developed in the last few years, and coupled with the folk horror kind of revival thing, that the two things together have created a more magical world for those of us who who were already like this, you know, th- th- this sort of like this this dream of an un an unrealized future, and somehow that lost future, rather than it being depressing or you know a sense of despondency coming out of it, has more of a strength of can't think of the word but almost like a sense of otherworldliness that we're sort of on the outside looking in and it's not at all a sense of isolation or a sense of distance or a sense of you know being exiled it's actually quite the opposite it's quite beautiful you know especially when you go back to look at old photographs or things. I saw one of the advanced passenger train, the initial one that was built in England in the late 70s, early 80s. And the thing just, you know, it had this evocative look to it. Yes, it was the 80s, but because it was made of stainless steel and not painted, it had this 1930s sort of weird fiction, uh, sci-fi look about it too. And and the eighties was kind of like that, wasn't it? The eight those those of us who lived through the eighties, you had the sixties with all the the sixties was an awful decade. It was horrible things went on in the sixties, but this whole thing it was a six the decade of love is completely nonsense. It was a time of assassinations and terrorism and mass starvations in Africa and Bangladesh. It was a time of real real racism, and things like you know, things like wars everywhere, you know, and a lot of sectarian conflicts in the Middle East and, every, you know, everywhere. Vietnam, the lot, and Northern Ireland, they're all kicked off in the 60s, the so-called, you know, era of love. And then we got the 70s, and there was a progression there. But something happened in the 80s. In the, in the, 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 I think electronic music had a lot to do with it. At the beginning of the 80s, you had things like Gary Newman, you know, and, you know, the album, the True by Army album that came out down in the park and all that. And then you had other things, electronic music breaking into the mainstream, you know, in a way that it didn't with, say, sort of like bands like Hawkwind and Kraftwerk before that. And it broke into things like movie soundtracks, you know, John Carpenter, and it created almost instantaneously the 80s was thrown back into a time that was pre-World War II in terms of the aesthetic. And you had a lot of that kind of... A sign of you had On the surface, you had the, the kind of pop culture of like, you know, the, the fluorescent colours of the 80s. But just underneath that was the world of the sort of the goths, the metalheads, uh, the electronic music bunch, you know, like that kind of thing that's, that sort of lived below that, the, the sort of like the, the hardcore punk scene that had a revival, particularly in America the trash scene and all that and uh, and that was probably the real 80s that was you know that was the real 80s below the surface uh, it wasn't a rejection of the mainstream because you'd find that many people back then even if they were kind of like the goth scene wouldn't have a problem listening to a madonna record and enjoying it if it was good kind of thing and so on but there was something about the 80s it, there was something about it and that's when I think the split happened, this cultural split. Even if you grew up, you were born in the 90s or 2000s, you're part of it, like a split happened. So you had the mainstream went one way. That would have been like the, you know, the Aquanet, big hair, sort of like Cosby family, 80s. And then the other part went the other way, which is kind of like the goth, dark metal, electronic music, electronic culture, horror films went the other way. And we're on that other way. We're on the other way trajectories still. And that's what got us through, you know, the, the 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 last four decades. Absolutely no doubt about it. And people who've been born since are born onto that same timeline that those of us who were around in the 80s kind of, you know, helped split. We helped split it. So this whole thing of, like, the divergence in culture really began in the 80s, I think, the very beginning of the 80s. I can remember, like, indicative things like the song and the video of Ghost Town by the the specials, you know. There was a, a that sort of urban 
hopelessness kind of came through. But it wasn't death. It was like it went into a world of, of ghostliness, of hauntology. Right? And, that's, and the hauntology that we have today, I think, is rooted in that kind of the future that never happened. And it never happened because we didn't want it. That's the important thing. It never happened because we didn't want it. Not because it was taken from us, but because instinctually we who fermented in that time and following generations who jumped onto our timeline didn't want that plastic artificial world that was, that was started in the awful 60s, the horrible culture of the 60s, and started moving on, where today it's now TikTok videos and all that nonsense. And the rest of us are all like, well, you're here. This is where you are. You're watching Hocus Pocus. You're watching Greg Moffat on Legalized Freedom. You're watching all the ancient site stuff. You're, you're involved in all of it. Now, on top of that, this sort of like purposeful, inherent, innate, subconscious and conscious rejection of the mainstream that has thrown us onto this hauntology timeline, into this world of high strangeness, we've also done the same with the past. You know, we've also, we're the ones who are looking back at the past and going, you know, something isn't right. Now, I have mixed feelings about Eric von Daniken. Eric von Daniken, when I was a little kid, he brought that book, Chariot of the Dog, the Gods, came out. And I have to say, it blew my mind as a child. But even then, I didn't fully buy that this was all built by ancient spacemen. And they were coming back. I don't know why. I just didn't buy it. But I was still amazed because I never knew really about all these places that existed around the world. Now, while it's highly likely and highly possible that Alan, the late, the late great Alan Watt, I did a doc, I did a talk with him once, oh, years and years ago, with Neil Foster, and uh, in in the broadcast, Alan, we both, you know, came to the conclusion that that Van Daniken wouldn't have got that profile if it wasn't done on purpose. And Alan Watt was the firm belief that the intelligence services created this ancient aliens thing in order to try and guide our future towards a transhumanist future. Totally agree with that, definitely. I do agree with that. I'd, I'd be very surprised if on Daniken, if he wasn't a, 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 a an intelligence service operative, that he wasn't funded and given the push into the mainstream, you know, big-time publishing, and he was a sensational back in the day, like he was. But it had... It had an ancillary effect. Another trajectory was thrown off that. And those of us who read those books or saw these documents, like, I hate that whole ancient aliens thing. It's awful. It's all, it's obviously, you know, it's obviously intelligence services. But there are those of us, especially back then, when I, it's, it's hard, you know, like, we have people nowadays, they go back and they examine the ancient past and they say, you know, they look at the work of, like, Graham Hancock. And they say things like, you know, Graham Hancock, he, you know, he's really opened up my mind. There's history, you know, history isn't right. You know, and people like Robert Temple, and the Dogon, and, you know, Robert Ruval. And, and they go, lots of people involved in this stuff. And even myself, to a small degree. They're, they're really looking at history. That never existed when I was young. Amazingly, that never existed when I was a kid. And and all through my, it wasn't until like I think Fingerprints of the Gods came out that people started to really look at things because they took things at sort of face value, even alternative stuff. Like Stonehenge alternative stuff was because it was a calendar, a lunar calendar. That, that whole thing that had been worked out in the, in the 1960s that these sites were calendars. And then we discovered later on that a lot of these people involved in this sort of stuff were Freemasons. And they were basically throwing us off the scent just like they were with the things like the Ren Le Chateau mysteries. That they, they, they take control of it, they write books about it, but they deliberately do it to throw us off the scent of the real thing. Just like they're involved in things like the Zetarian things and the flat air nonsense today. It's the same thing. They, they're throwing you off the truth. So, amazingly, there was a time when there was nothing like that. And those of us who started to grow up and it sort of read Chariot of the Gods, Eric Van Daniken's book, and, and started to say, you know, the alien stuff is bullshit. It's, it's, it, it, it's not true. Clearly not true. But 
he does bring up a point that, that this stuff doesn't make a lot of sense. It, in terms of the classical out of Babylon, out of Sumer timeline we were, we were raised with. And I can remember having a discussion at Boyle Abbey in County Roscommon well, while they were restoring the Abbey. They did a beautiful job, by the way, restoring the Abbey there. And it was a guy from the Office of Public Works. And we were talking about, like, I was saying, like, you know, they say the Romans never conquered Ireland, but look at this building. It's built with Romanesque arches. So it was a, a cultural sort of, like, con- conquest when you think about it. And he goes, yeah. And, I, I, and he says to me, you know, what kind of thing? I, I said, I'm interested in historic mysteries. This guy was an, arch- an archaeologist working for the Office of Public Works. And he says, yeah, he, he says, like, the, the whole, you know, the whole thing of, like, the, the, the timelines. Yeah, it's a big time. And he says, you know about Graham Hancock? He says, yeah, yeah, interesting guy. So he wasn't a closed-minded guy. And I said to him, he was probably like Neil Rushton. He's probably not an archaeologist anymore. But anyway, I said to him, I read those von, uh, Eric von Danigan books, and they were nonsense about the alien stuff. But I tell you, they really made me think that the historical timelines need to be questioned. And that's really what Eric von Danigan's true legacy is, that this stuff, there was obviously anomalies in the past, so it's easier for say the, you know the the, the intelligence services, as people were becoming true technology, like let's say Easter Island, ancient Egyptian stuff, and we're starting to see photographs of holes drilled in granite that look like they were drilled with an electric drill, and even have the grooves on the inside where they could count the rotation speed of the drill, and even were bizarre shapes and the strange interlocking system above the king's chamber in the Great Pyramid, and saying how that there wasn't even room to turn the stone, and yet they got it in there, and so on, regardless of what the reason was. And they had, they, uh, instead of having us, ordinary people, saying, you know, I think that human beings had high technology of some kind in the past, at least when it came to masonry and stonework and, and engineering. That kind of structural engineering. Instead of us coming to that natural conclusion, they sent people like Eric von Daniken and the Ancient Aliens TV series out there to keep the Masonic, and this is what it really is, it's Freemasonry, the Masonic Anilusius intact. The belief that it all began when Lucifer was thrown out of heaven and gave humanity free will 3,500 BC. If you look at all the, I call them now, the Masonic historical timelines, they always come back to 3,500 BC. 3,500 BC is when they said that the the Sahara Desert was desiccated. Uh, 3,500 BC is when they said Stonehenge was completed. And it goes on and on all over the world. It's always 3,000. It's one of those maxims, like there's always 6 million issues for something, you know, now uh, for loads of things. And then 3,500 BC. Now, the 3,500 BC thing keeps the Anilusius, uh, the Archbishop Usher, who was the Archbishop of Armagh, who came up with the actual dating of the world since Genesis. So it keeps his Anilusius idea intact, a very central thing to Scottish Rite, uh, Irish, Swedish, German, British, York, Scottish masonry intact. So the all those things the same. All that, when you see an ancient alien show, think Freemasons, think Freemasons giving the the profane a diversion. So you're sitting there watching someone like Nick Pope and, st- and all these people, and you, you just you just look at that screen. And now I'm not saying everyone involved in a- ancient aliens. I'm talking about like the main central hosts behind it, that the ones who appear in all the episodes and stand on stage at the events, including Mr. Van Daniken, just think Freemasons. Just think that. Keeping the Anna Lucia stuff intact, because they don't want... And that's why you have the Royal Irish Academy here in Ireland doing the exact same, you know, that we were all animals before St. Patrick, a fictional figure showed up, and so on and so forth. Remember, there's deceptions everywhere. Everywhere. So that was the legacy. of That was an indirect legacy. And it may not have been an indirect direct legacy because the Freemasons also have this thing where the profane who are worthy, who figure the real thing out, uh, they kind of respect you. 
so we're probably left alone. It's a bit like the prickly pear and the needle crab. Uh, on one hand, they just handed it out there, but they're looking at people like us who said, no way. And they're saying, you know, fair play. They, they may, they may, we have, may have been selected to survive, just like we may be selected to figure out the real truth without having to go through the lodge system. Always remember that. So that was the thing with Eric von Daniken. Eric von Daniken is always, always look at that thing as he opened the door indirectly, but maybe directly, to the world we live in now, those of us on this ontological timeline, whereby we say there's something seriously wrong with the historical time frame, and we've obviously been given a lot of crap, and this is our way of sort of like using his work about the spacemen to figure out the ancient past for ourselves. And boy, what a trip it is. And I hope, I hope the, the next hour or so of this show will be a similar trip for you guys because there's lots, there's lots, just even me talking about this or even Sarah and I talking about on Hocus Pocus. It could, and on and, and all the other shows out there, we, 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 we tend to like, they, there's a shift of consciousness just by talking about this stuff. I consider what I'm, say, doing tonight would be very similar to, say, in the Nordic or the, the Northern European dark winter, where you're sitting around the fire and you have the the elders telling stories with the fl flickering embers uh, about the great gods, you know, Kukulin, Tyr, Odin, Wotan, Vales, you know, all, all these Dunar, all these great gods stories and mythological epics and it seeps into your consciousness and it resides there and it was it, it it grows like a garden and creates a worldview that has actually served you in life sarah and i have a book coming out i know it's taking time we want to get it right about how both of us i mean this is one of the things that we kind of like bonded on is that we both agreed that our interest in you know dystopian sci-fi horror films ghost stories ghost hunting ancient mysteries actually gave us the psychic defense tools to avoid going down the prickly pear road and and and, and escaping that world when it was when it was between 2020 and 2022 it, we saw and i'm sure many of you listen to this same way and this is why in the and when i was doing the Rona chronicles in the early days i couldn't help but constantly make, you know, references to Quatermass, to Doctor Who, to things like that, to Twilight Zone episodes. As it had given us a kind of a software that allowed us to glide through that period. And this brings us to the first of the Fortean reviews of the year, and that has to be, and it's still amazing to me, and I know people are going to say, Oh, it's all, you know, it's it's all a setup. And that's Tucker Carlson talking about they're not aliens, they're demons or some kind of interdimensional things, which you've heard me talking about for years now. And I'm not the only one. I've never, ever believed, ever once, probably for a small period when I was 10 or 11 or 12 or 13, that there were spacemen coming in spacecraft. It was something didn't sit right with me and i it was so frustrating to me the whole spacemen and spaceships coming thing that i actually gave up even looking at it for years and years and years until the mid 1980s and whitley striber published his groundbreaking book communion and that is is description of the visitors and all that stuff it really it kicked me off again and i went back and i I read John Keel's original Mothman prophecy and all the books that came out that's around that time saying, no, there's something bigger to this. In the same way, the ancient alien stuff encouraged some people to go, no, I, I don't think it's really about aliens. There's something wrong with the historical timeline. The same thing with books like Communion and the Mothman prophecy that they, you went, no, there's something not right here. It's not about spacemen and spaceships. It's kind of like linked to our ancient ancestors and their concept of fairy folklore and fairy faith and all that kind of thing. 
and of course demons and the jinn. Now, in the same vein as this whole thing with Tucker Carlson coming out of the closet, so to speak, and talking about the, these entities not being aliens, but rather demons. Now, it also brings us back to that classic call to the Art Bell show, which I, I believe is legit, absolutely. And the so-called call that came back a few Weeks later, by a guy saying it was a prank call, I, it doesn't even sound like him. It's not the same voice. That guy was not acting. That guy was genuinely terrified. He had been working in Area 51, and he said that these things were demons, and they were working with the government, and they were going to depopulate the Earth massively. Well, here we are in 2024, just coming into it, and you tell me that didn't happen during 2020 to 22 that's what happened okay now in relation to all this stuff this really you know prior to this i would have thought in the dimensionals you know in fairy kind of thing whatever they are they've always been here with us like crowley said and then the, in the past they were demons in the future they will be something else the whole lamb thing you know that kind of alien thing and totally agree with all that, but something happened in 2008 that left a profound effect on me. It was when I got I first got really good internet here in rural Sligo, and I was able to stream, uh, and you know reliably stream YouTube chat videos, and that was the golden age of like YouTube and conspiracy. If you looked at like the biggest, the number one videos on it were things like Alex Jones. You know, it, it, it could, you know, Truter videos about 9-11 and stuff like that completely owned YouTube. The numbers were no enormous. This is why they had to crack down on him. But so I used to, what I used to do was I used to, there were, everything was a 10 minute clip because they, there was no video longer than 10 minutes. This is when, before YouTube was owned by Google, I still think it was owned by the two young lads who invented it. So what I used to do was I would download the videos using soft DVD or some program like that, put burn them onto a, a, a DVD, and then play them when I had a chance. So like usually for breakfast in the morning, uh, I, I would watch these kind of like conspiracy videos and other kinds of videos like that, or all interesting old videos, you know, that I hadn't seen for years. <clears throat> um, that kind of thing. There are people starting to upload. And YouTube was a wonderful thing back then. It still is in many ways. In a lot of ways, YouTube is it's still kind of wonderful. No, I'm here on it. You know, so there I was. And I found this video that has haunted me ever since. A series of videos that were filmed over the Black Sea in Turkey in mid-2008 called the Kumburgaz event or the Kumburgaz videos. Now, if you haven't seen these videos, go online and find them because they changed me as a person when I saw them. Basically, it started out as you're in very similar to like classic UFO stories, uh, alien stories. Like the Mothman story started with l lights over the water. And, and this is something we really have to think deeply about is the connection between paranormal events and, and rivers and water and stuff like that. It hasn't given, been given enough attention. They got you looking at places like Mount Shasta and stuff like that. But what appeared on the video looked like a kind of a, a 1930 style spaceship. And you say, okay, it's, it's a fake or it's a fraud. Or then you say it's a military technology. But what's really peculiar about this thing is the more you look at it, the more it concerns you. It seems to have a solid material structure made of a kind of a metal, but it shapeshifts. It, it moves and it, it, it dissolves in itself and moves in itself. And what appears is it's almost like it's egregoric. The first guy started out with lights. He started filming them. Now, the lights always seem to appear between 2.30 and 4 o'clock a.m. in the morning, when they were filming 2008. And they started out as basic lights that were hovering above the Black Sea. 
and then as time goes on turned into by the time like the end of July into August into this the spaceship is what I kind of describe it looking I'm not saying it is but what it looked like and then it started to morph until one point it it seems to open up in the middle and you see what looked like two gray aliens looking out of it and it's obviously something that's trying to build itself as a visual event in order to create something rather than it being this form all the time and what makes it even more sort of surreal is that it ref moonlight is reflecting off the top of it so it is solid to an extent in that it manifests but I was watching these videos over and over again and I literally had to stop after a while because I said you know what this is the real thing there's something going on here there's something going on with these videos and it's it's a portal it's a gate it's been opened and then they stopped and so it was only during 2008 summer now the Comburgas event was referred to by none other but than Jack Valley the great you know, author and UFO research as 100% genuine footage, and I agree they are. And uh, the, you think Turkey, you think the Black Sea. Well, that leads us to the eventual thing of the jinn. And the jinn being able to appear and shape shift and appear as different things. We will cover this more in depth in the Hocus Focus book, but uh, they are a separate species to humans. I mean, they have lifetimes, they eat lifespans, they eat, and everything else, but they operate in a different function. But they, they like the stories of interdimensionals around the world, they have a dislike of human beings in general, not always, and generally they 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 try to fit in by fooling us into believing their visions of the Virgin Mary. That's covered very heavily in the Hocus Focus book. And they're also spaceships, aliens. And this is what I, you know, John Keel called them ultra-terrestrials. I think that's an excellent term. But to go into studying these things as they are, people seem to end up dead. And uh, Rosemary Ellen Guiley, who wrote that magnificent book, The Vengeful Jinn, she was, uh, you know, one of, probably the greatest, in my opinion, the greatest modern paranormal researcher, and started to get booed off the stage at UFO conferences because she was saying, I don't think any of them are spaceships or anything like that. I think they're all, if they're not, if they're not secret technology by the government, and that's still maybe connected to the jinn thing, it's the jinn or something like it. And they weren't ready for it. They weren't. They wanted. They, all they wanted. They're the same kind of ancient alien crowds. All they wanted was a spaceman. The aliens are coming. They're going to bring us free energy, and they're going to save us and bring eternal peace. Sort of like space Jesus kind of things, you know. That psyop that's been running for two thousand years. Uh, go and watch the Kumburgas video and. What I would say is turn the volume down on that and play the Area 51 caller to Art Bell at the same time. And I guarantee you the hairs will stand on edge when you're doing this and it will change your entire consciousness regarding the whole alien thing. So this has now, so that, that, that for me was a big moment of wake up, you know, around that time when that all happened. That was a big a big moment of revelation for me is like it was almost like that was the point I knew the world was changing and we were heading into a very different scheme of things a very different type of world was coming and that's when I started to write books on the psychop psychopaths like elaborate puzzling people I started writing it not long after that and if you read puzzling people it's as much as a 40 in book as it is a, you know, a book on psych, you know, psychology and neurology and stuff like that, because I throw in a lot of truth bombs regarding how we see mythological archetypes and this kind of thing. 
it was the only way I could sneak it in, you know, and he finished the final chapter of the book in the appendix. I talk about how the a, fa a powerful family in the United Arab Emirates claimed to be direct descendants of the jinn. Now, uh, this was deliberately put in there by me uh, without it, without me top loading it, like saying, oh, the psychopaths are the jinn, the, uh, nothing like that. I wanted people to start examining the psychopathic thing in a spiritual way. And the fact that I got attacked by, I would call them demonic individuals in the years ever since, shows me I was on the right path. Because they were almost like Renfielded by the fact that I had hit the truth on this stuff. And, you know, someone said recently that the NPC is almost like the psychopath waiting to be filled. I think there's an awful lot of truth to that. We saw that during the 2020 to 2022. And here we are living in these times where we feel like we're living in a dystopian sci-fi film because guess what, folks? We are. We are. And uh, the Tucker Carlson thing, no matter what's behind it, it is deeply significant. And I don't think they're hiding anymore. I don't... This is the whole thing. You know what they were saying for years? Like you have the Alex Joneses and the David Ikes and all these people saying, they're going to do this, they're going to do that, and they're hiding it. And it was called conspiracy theory or paranoia. And then suddenly they don't hide it anymore. In, you know, in 2020... It was almost like, well, late it was really 2019. It was really like they said, we're not, well, why bother hiding it anymore? Let's just be honest about it. And this is literally the world we live in now. Uh, because the, 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 once they got the needle craft rolled out, it didn't matter who knew what. Because they, a significant qu qu portion of the population are on death row because of it. And also, the ones who are, you know, before they die, they lose their brains. They're not able to think. Their whole cognitive elements of their of the personality are, are just completely diminished so the second 14 times starting to 40 times well 40 times that is 50th anniversary this year so that's it's kind of like a good that's does suit this as well the second 40 paranormal event of the year is the major search for the first time in 50 years for the mythical loch ness monster which if you know me and I don't believe it's an actual beast or an animal or cryptozoology thing. I believe that the, the, the main culprit is probably Crowley and his Abamel and the mage brought this ritual in the Leskin house, brought this thing through and it's trapped in the water ever since because he didn't close the ritual when he, because he had to run off to do business with the golden Dawn and McGregor's, McGregor's Mathers. So, so this year, 2023, they had the first, major search in years with 200 vol volunteers in really bad weather and around 300 people showed up o overall with the 200 on the ground and they took out boats with hydrophone systems underground you know microphones underwater microphones and they recorded four strange noises now, this reminds me immediately of the bloop, which we also cover in the Hocus Focus group uh, book that took place under the ocean in the South Pacific, exactly where Rael is mentioned by Lovecraft, where Cthulhu is dead but dreaming. And what we heard of the bloop was a speeded up noise. If you play that back at actual speed, it sounds even more like an animal, a gigantic animal. So they hear these four distinctive noises. And and according to the researchers, we didn't know what the origin was, which is quite quite exciting. And a guy called McKenna, this is, and he said the weather in Scotland was horrific over the weekend, so much so that the Scottish Highland Games were cancelled for the first time in 75 years. Did the search for Nessie somehow affect the weather? That's what I'd like to know. We had people coming from all over the world. We had people from Spain, France, Germany, and we even had a Finnish couple. We had a news team from Japan, Australia, America, and it's been really good in terms of getting publicity out there. And we all kind of banded together in a family kind of way. It was fantastic. A guy called Paul Nixon, at the general manager of the Loch Ness Center, said he felt there was something in the lake worth looking for, adding, I believe there is something big lurking in the depths. When I read that quote, I remember thinking to myself, that's interesting the language that this man Paul Nixon uses from the Loch Ness Center. He said there was something, quote-unquote, in the lake 
worth looking for. I believe there is something big lurking in the depths of Loch Ness. And then he continued on by saying, No, I don't know whether it's a monster. I don't know what it is, but I reckon there's something down there. Now, Mr. Nixon is obviously aware, being on the banks of that loch every day doing his job, that there's something different to the Loch Ness Monster. And it this is all happening in tandem with the restoration of Beleskin House, which is a very interesting. So as and I've been you know I've been talking about this for a while. I said as Beleskin House is restored uh, by this this volunteer team who are restoring it, which is a great thing I might add. It would it would it would energize whatever is entity is the Loch Ness monster, and that's exactly what's happened. To the point now where it's bringing people back for the first time in 50 years to do a serious uh, examination of the phenomena in the lake. And that man Paul Nixon from the Loch Ness Centre said that, well, you know, you know, what more can you say? Now, going back to the gin, the apparently it's the jinn has always been a big deal in the Islamic world, which is where it originates from. But apparently in Pakistan, a country I don't really have a lot of respect for because I don't really think it should exist. And uh, I'm not going to get into politics, but, you know, people talk about a, the- a theological state. And they they mention a certain one in the, the Middle East they all have a problem with. But they, they seem to ignore the this this place called Pakistan, which is nothing but a theological state. And this is a story that comes from the Pakistani.pk newspaper, and it says the unseen gin of inflation plaguing Pakistanis. And this was published back in October uh, by someone. It just says by it doesn't give the name. Just the, it's un it's un it's uncredited. Pakistan is currently facing a significant economic channel challenge due to inflation. The rising cost of living demands an understanding of the factors contributing to high prices, how Pakistanis are coping with inflation and the strategies that the government and policy makers can implement to control and stabilize the economy. Since 2022, the inflation rate in Pakistan has been rising significantly. In June 2023, the headline inflation based on the Consumer Price Index reached 29.4%. That is absolutely huge, Jesus Christ. Up from 21.3 in June 2022. As a result, many Pakistanis have had to reduce the number of items in their shopping list due to a combination of factors. The recent increase in petrol prices, which are directly related to energy prices, is one of the main reasons behind the inflation in Pakistan. The war between Russia and Ukraine leading to a fluctuating oil prices in the international market has a direct impact on the transportation of electricity, electricity and manufacturing costs in Pakistan. The agricultural sector plays a pivotal role in the country's economy. Any disruption in the agricultural supply chain caused by factors such as unseasonal rains, floods, droughts or pest infestations, infestations can cause food shortages which subsequently lead to a rise in food prices. This vulnerability is argu- augmented by the absence of, absence of modern agricultural practices and insufficient storage facilities in Pakistan. That's because, you know, modern technology, you know, other than nuclear weapons, they say, oh, we can't have it because it's not in the Quran. The monetary policy of the country plays a significant role in inflation. Low interest rates can help boost economic growth. However, if kept for a long period, it can cause inflationary pressures. Hence, it is necessary to strike a balance between economic growth and inflation control. How Pakistan is coping, and then it goes on and on and on and so on. Now, what the article implies then is that the Pakistanis believe an unseen jinn or spiritual force is behind and these economic problems in the country. This stuff is taken very, very seriously in that part of the world. In fact, I know a Pakistani guy, and he told me he's seen the jinn around here. You probably heard me tell this story before. While he went out jogging, he plays cricket, and he was tell- and he keeps fit by jogging. He said, down by the old factories, by the railway stations, I've seen them. The lights moving around by the tracks. And... So they, they really believe that stuff. They don't, they, to them, that's, that's as real to them as, as the fairies were. Probably more so 
than the fairies were than the old Irish people. So they, on one hand, you can say you can laugh at this and say you know they, they, their government is making a shit of their economic, you know, standing. But the other side, because that they're more primitive, and remember this stuff comes from pagan, their pagan past, the dev, and so on, the ev, that they know that there are gremlins, unseen forces that are behind things that cause human hardship, and of course you know if you're to look at the needlecraft, well there it is right there, there is definitely an unseen human force behind it, and so a pick. Out that story is one of the significant ones of the year. In that, as the prickly pear takes its effect in a much larger number this year, watch the normies degenerate. I and I and I'm saying degenerate, and I mean that literally. Then they're not going to elevate or become enlightened into a spiritual justification for why they're all dying. Eventually they can't, and not, you know, you have families who are like, there'll be 10 at like this Christmas and next year there'll be 4. They can't deny it anymore. And expect Christian churches, particularly the super churches in America and those kinds of born again Pentecostals types, to start talking about divine punishment, divine retribution. And you're going to see it getting very middle ages very quickly, just like it got very middle ages very quickly in Pakistan when their thing went down. So that's not only a Fortean review uh, you know, story of the year, but also a bit of a something, a prediction to look forward in future. Uh, because the prickly pairism can only be denied for so long, and you just wait until a divine... In, they'll, they'll switch from the climate change divine punishment to this. Uh, but it'll be much more literal, much more theological, much more, you know, superficially Christian or superficially, you know, revelations, you know, judgment day kind of thing. But watch out for that starting next year. It's going to be very, very interesting. Uh, they will start blaming it all on, you know, God is punishing us for whatever reason. And they might even try to say it's because of the climate change. In fact, they, they you know, here in Ireland, the, one of the ministers for health actually, or one of the douchebags for hell, I don't know who he was, actually even said that climate change was probably causing the sudden deaths around the country of young people. So that was why I picked that as one of the main stories of last year, is because it has a predictive quality going forward. It's going to get very early Middle Ages very quickly. Returning to space again, Joe Rogan revealed this year information from a dying Soviet cosmonaut regarding the hidden secrets of what happened in the Soviet space exploration program of the 1960s and 70s. Now, this period of the late 60s, early 70s is clouded by uh, the Apollo missions of NASA putting men, a man on the moon, and after the first mission with Neil Armstrong, you know, people did lose interest, and they found it very difficult to sustain interest on you know, on these lunar, manned lunar missions, uh, because uh, just people, the novelty had gone off after the first one. It was costing the U.S. government colossal amounts of money to keep these lunar missions going, and the Apollo 13 near disaster created a public interest for a while. And then it just became a thing of like NASA, tr NASA trying to get TV ratings by nonsense like the astronauts hitting a golf ball on the moon and things like that. And it became quite, even though those 20, 20 or so missions were planned, the last one was Apollo 17 because the public just weren't interested. Also, there was really nothing gained from going to the moon except to say the United States put men on the moon. And and that's not play down. That was an incredible achievement. And they were very brave military men who did that. So let's not, you know, let's not break that one down in terms of like diminishing it. But growing up, you know, in that wake of that period, I was, you know, the I was only a little baby when that was still going on. 
like, you know, coming into, you know, later childhood, I could hear, like, adults around me talking about how the Russians were, had lost the space race, and the Russians couldn't get a man on the moon, and they were beaten by NASA and gave up. And, of course, when the 1990, when this, the Soviet Union collapsed, and we had the whole thing of perestroika, and so many things came out, we realized then begrudgingly in the west that the soviets are probably more advanced in space exploration than the 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 nasa were and the simple reason was in rather than this kind of like gung-ho of creating a hero creating heroes like modern day flash gordons and captain kirks which the western culture had been sort of indoctrinated with they put their efforts into unmanned space probes uh, interplanetary probes and they set about trying to solve mysteries that were much more worth solving than playing golf on the moon which is with the, with the farce that the NASA thing eventually went into now Joe Rogan had this story re during the year on his show about this guy who was a cosmonaut on his deathbed who revealed that these planets, particularly Mars and Venus, are far far more strange, weird, and uh, had affected the Soviet space exploration system to a far deeper psychological degree than people can realize. Now, to find a comparison, look at the Apollo 11 astronauts when they came back at that press conference. Uh, they had obviously experienced something up there that they weren't ready for. I'm in total agreement with the whole Lovecraft thing is that we're not meant to travel far. We live on a placid island of ignorance, floating in a void. Space is weird up there. You know, I looked at when I was making the film Lever Provident Lever Velocity. I was I looked at every single Apollo lunar photograph. Most of them are terrible. They've been destroyed by the sun or radiation. And there's only a, literally the ones we see are the only ones that are worthy of printing in the media. Most of them are just, you know, they're weird angles or they're just, they're just not good photographs. But I remember coming away from looking at that. It was a similar kind of feeling that I had looking at those 2008 UFO footage in the Black Sea. That the moon was a haunted world. That it was a far darker and sinister and mysterious place than people realize. And that's why we're white on Earth, the moon is often, you know, associated with the paranormal, the you know, werewolves and mysteries and murders and that kind of thing, ghost stories. Now, while the NASA stuff was going on, we were told, as I said, growing up, that the Russians had completely failed in their space, yet yeah, they had some early day stuff, Yuri Gagarin, Gagarin, the first man in space, and they had the Sputnik, the first orbital satellite in space. But after that, it kind of all fell apart. The, you know the great the great one was NASA and the Americans and all that, and that's not true at all. In many ways, as I said, they were producing space interplanetary probes that were light years ahead of any things the Americans had. And while the Americans had, you know, been reduced to try and boosting TV ratings by playing golf on the moon or hitting a golf ball on the moon, the the Soviets were developing unbelievable technology to get onto Mars and Venus. Now, the thing with Venus is it makes no sense. Venus should be very similar to the Earth, only a little bit warmer. It's closer to the sun, but not that closer. And there's no reason why Venus should not have a, a an atmosphere and a climate, uh, and you know, and a biosphere even, similar to the Earth. Now, we've all read the work of Emmanuel Velikovsky, World in Motions, and his, his theory that was, and it was proven correct, that he said Venus would be much more hotter than people expected it to be because there was a, a kind of residual friction that was caused by another planet entering, the, or a comet or a planet entering the inner solar system, knocking against, like a pool ball or a billiard ball and knocking Venus out of orbit and then pushing it it used to be between the Earth and Mars or in that area between Mars and Jupiter and it then ended up in an orbital trajectory between Earth and, and the Sun but not that much close to the Sun there was, there was still Mercury in between 
and his theory was that this is all recorded in mythology that this was all the, the cataclysms or the catastrophism of the past was Venus moving past the earth and possibly dumping its oceans on top of the earth would this would you know those of you who follow the, the expanding earth theory and it's not the, it's not the worst idea in the world I mean on the logically logically in terms of anecdotal evidence where the you know tectonic plates seem to have moved apart it does seem plausible in terms of the animations they show of how the earth could have grown now the one of the the big anomalies in all this is where did the water come from where did the oceans come from and that's a very valid point now velikovsky's catastrophism is true and he's been proven to be right on a lot of stuff the oceans may have been deposited on earth from where from venus venus probably had an ocean maybe even mars and the oceans were thrown across towards the direction of earth and literally came down in a deluge and this was the the flood myths of ancient mythology this was velikovsky's theory more or less in that in that you know in that in that light now this moved Venus into its current orbital path around the, the Sun and there was an inert sense of friction that caused residual heating of the planet that will remain to this day and Velikovsky said when probes would get to Venus they would find it was incredibly hot and that's exactly what happened I mean the air pressure is unbelievable it rains sulfuric acid and uh, it's incredibly hot it shouldn't be much more warmer than the, than the earth but it is literally on fire in terms of its temperature it has it's the ultimate greenhouse effect now while the americans were tied up on the whole and i'm not i'm not putting down the american space agency i mean they did do voyager one and two and that's they've probably been the greatest you know pro, interplanetary probes ever but the russians set themselves to getting on venus and mars using unmanned probe robots and they developed these remarkable robots that walked could walk across the surface of a planet and they'd already tested them on the moon or you know tested some of the engineering by landing on the moon so while the americans were landing apollo spaceships the russians were constantly landing rovers on the moon including one that took back including one that took back soil from the uh, the surface of the moon and brought it successfully back to earth so well that's soil rocks and uh, they these rowers that they made they had a kind of a cam system they're, they're very simple you know very robust classic soviet engineering very robust and they had these cam systems that kind of moved a kind of two legs forward lifted the rover off the ground and then the cam moved it forward a few centimeters so that way it could travel across a planetary surface so the russians went about putting landers on venus and mars and bringing back the first photographs of these places now what was amazing was now they had failures and successes too was the remarkable secrecy that um, that surrounded these missions now we know it's the cold war and so on but even when 1990 came along and perestroika and the sharing of information so allegedly we we learned everything it was about learning about the soviet union except specific details regarding the soviet union's interplanetary probes on the moon mars and venus they were very silent and still remain very silent so joe rogan revealed this year that a, a dying russian astronaut had announced that they had found literally some kind of life on these planets and uh, this is why they shut it down and they shared this information with nasa and both space agencies came to an agreement that this is the kind of stuff that we should not tell the public again there's again like the, the ancient alien thing it, they've created the lunar hoax thing in order to hide what they discovered on the moon i, I know some of you think that the the you know that the whole apollo missions were hoax when you look into the so-called things that cl that that claimed to have hoaxed the mission they're always easily debunked all of them 
and it would have been it's true that's that that claim that it would have been it's cheaper to go and easier to go to the moon than to have created an apollo lunar hoax what they discovered on the moon was very strange what they discovered on mars is even stranger that there's something up there in space that's directly re and you know astronauts reported uh, strange things in craters and it, it, it leaked back on their radios that they saw things and it's not just only on the planets but it's also in X I think it was Edgar Mitchell said that he saw critters outside the Gemini window rocket window and then there's a the famous tether in this incident involving the space shuttle when they were trying to find a way to create electrical power for satellites using a long tether gathering energy from the sun and as soon as it broke loose and switched on it was surrounded by what looked like jellyfish millions of them all swarming around it as if the electrical power had attracted them in the same way starlings fly towards the light of a city and that or moths through a flame this cannot be leaked out to the public because it's the end of darwinism and you have to remember that Darwinism is a religion to these people. Natural selection and it can, life can only exist on planets like the Earth and it can't live in space. Even though Prince Philip said, he, when he, he was asked once at a party, uh, that he, what he, he told people he was very interested in UFOs and he said, oh, they're animals. That was the word he used. There's some kind of animal living up in, in space. And that's people, and I've, I thought, I've seen my first UFO about seven years ago now, flying over Sligo Bay. It was like a, a plasma-shaped egg that moved slowly, and that's the impression I got. It wasn't a machine. It was an animal. The, the famous Tic Tac thing. And this Tic Tac thing seems to be related to all this space. It's almost like when we started going into space, they took notice of us too. And the Joe Rogan thing, although it was short on details because of the language thing, it was very intriguing that it ties in beautifully and explains why these um, American and, you know, the Apollo, not Apollo, the NASA interplanetary robots are sending back very good high quality pictures of Mars show things that appear to be parts of buildings or machined or, you know, literally structures or things like that and then occasionally things that look like animals looking out behind rocks now right in the middle of all this stuff when it was going on and i remember watching this as a little kid while these martian and venus probes were happening there was a very strange tv program a mockumentary a drama that was broadcast in 1977 and what was weird about it was that it wasn't just shown on British TV but it was shown on television channels all over Europe at the same time and was called Alternative 3. Now Alternative 3 it was kind of it's been compared to the radio Orson Welles or the world's radio broadcast but it, it's really it's pretty it's very badly made in terms of the acting. The acting is atrocious. But you also want to know what's really going on. Because the premise of this program was that it starts off with all these parents of these scientists. These young people who are scientists. Now, it, it, Britain was experiencing something in the 70s called a brain drain. Where because of high taxation and lack of opportunity and all this sort of social problems going on in Britain in the 70s. That large numbers of the highly educated people within the UK were emigrating to like Australia, Canada and the United States in particular. And there was a great thing that they would believe that all the best people were being lost overseas because, you know, Britain was falling apart at the time. You know, three day work weeks and blackouts and all we covered this also in the Hocus Focus group and the hauntological after effects of that. But right in the middle of all this, right in the middle of all this bleak 70s stuff, remember the, the 70s was a very strange decade in these, these islands than it was compared to America. We didn't have that American sort of like happy 70s vibe. We didn't have that. It was a dark, cold, bleak, but also beautiful in the terms of its introspective time. But this alternative three came out in 1977. And it starts off with really bad acting of, of 
it's supposed to be the parents of these scientists who are saying, well, he got on a plane and vanished, or she got on a plane to Australia. We've never heard of them ever again, and so on. And uh, the, I mean, they, they spent money on it. They actually got Brian Eno to write some of the music, and um, it came out on Anglia TV, which is an which is an English ch independent channel, with the was broadcast nat nationally on the ITV networks at all countries, sorry, and. I can remember even my mother being sort of like affected by it uh, about what it really meant. But the, the the thing was that basically the earth was going to be destroyed, right? And all these, they were going to build a breakaway civilization on Mars. And why they decided to do this was that when the Viking lander from the US landed on Mars and switched its camera on, they saw animals running around. And that's at the very end of the film. They saw animals running around on the uh, on the surface of Mars. Now this happened that you know really going into ontology here now. This happened at the same time a few years later that this is a magnificent time to be growing up. It really was that the ITV also broadcast Quaid Mass Four, the one with John Mills, and that starts off with a a space station breaking up uh, because of this alien force that's harvesting life off the earth now these programs alternative 3 quite a mass 4 and others of that era were probably closer to the truth of what was going on in terms of what the powers that be knew and hid from us than stuff that came later like V and stuff you have V, that v now V was a very entertaining and well made show, series when it came out in the 80s but it was one of those things like you know oh, dang, dang, rap coiled and all this but like the, the real thing was that it was an unseen force and, and what is the whole, when you look at the whole UFO alien thing and, and, and its connection to the paranormal in general what is it? It's a story of an unseen force you know it's an unseen force and I do think this was probably an element of whistleblowing here that someone came out with this. That, you know, th that something happened. And we, I always suspected this. I always suspected that the, underneath all this stuff, underneath all this sci fi, you know, dystopian sci fi horror. But there was an element of truth to it in terms of some kind of alien force exerting a an effect upon the human race. And this year we got a slight peek in the door when Joe Rogan featured that thing on the Russian cosmonaut. Now, the Russians were deeply affected by what they discovered on both Mars and Venus, as were the Americans on the moon. To the point where the Americans invented the lunar moon hoax. Because they know most people are stupid and fall for anything. And uh, and put it out there through films like Capricorn 3. Sorry folks, you haven't been, you know, you haven't been, you haven't debunked them. They've actually duped you. Those of you who think you're like great researchers. The other way around, you've been duped. Second time. But the Russians just shut up about it. The Russians just, they just, and they're still silenced about it. And this is another part of this revelation that's happened since 2020. Is that many of us who have grown up believing that, you know, it's, it's yeah, okay. We've grown up on the UFOs, the aliens. We've grown up on the strange lights in the sky. We've grown up on the paranormal. We've grown up on all this stuff, but... You know, it's something more. It's some. It's something tantalizingly more, but it's also something frighteningly dark. To the point where, now the Russian space agency was way ahead of the Americans, even during the Apollo years. Don't let. Don't keep swallowing that propaganda that they were backward and you know they failed. They were. They were just off doing something else. And the point where it literally. I often wonder if it played a part in the, the breakup of the Soviet Union. Like, if at the very top of the Politburo, 
in the Kremlin after all the strange stuff was discovered about the nature of reality beyond the Earth's atmosphere. Did it create a kind of a mind virus where suddenly the Soviet Union and the communist dream didn't matter anymore? And it dissolved and fell apart as a result of that. Now we're told that, you know, Chernobyl played a big part in that. And there's lots of, there's lots of weird stuff around Chernobyl. And, you know, 14 type stuff, but it, it wasn't that. There was, you know, if you have this great plan, per se, the king of the world, you know, or a great sort of ideological, you know, agenda, quest. And then you discovered that literally you're nothing. Like what the, like the, you, you have a psychic breakdown. And even though you try to deny it, you fall apart. And a classic example of that would be the Aztecs, right? The Aztecs were the undisputed kings of Mexico and that part of the world. They had inherited this phenomenal city in Mexico City from the, where Mexico City is now, where all the great pyramids of the sun are, from a previous mysterious civilization called the Toltecs, who were the real ones behind all that. And the Aztecs took it over. And they were the Mac Daddies until these Spanish galleons appeared on the horizon. And and they had literally a psychic breakdown. They literally, suddenly, they were not, in their world, they're kings of the world. But when they encounter a force greater than them, a, can, a sort of psychic cancer sets in. And the empire, the ideology, begins to dissolve. And that's what I think might have happened to the Soviet Union following these discoveries in space. And I think Joe Rogan has kind of blown this thing this year to that point. Again, also, we've seen it with the United States and the West. It's dissolving. The, you know, as Alan Moore said, reality is turning to steam. We are living in very strange times. A, you know... I'm not going to, I can't talk because I'll get banned, but you know about the needle crap, prickly prayers, and the suddenly and unexpectedly, and the, the, the percentage increases in people no longer being here, and the changes in people's personality, the, the NPC phenomena, the ready made zombie, you know, the, the whole thing. The TikTok world is some, it's broken, and exactly what was portrayed at the beginning of Quatermass 4. Where, you know, Sir Bernard Quatermass goes to the TV show in London to, to see this live broadcast of an American spaceship dissolving in space after being hit with a tractor beam. Or not a tractor beam, but some kind of force from outer space by an alien sort of predatory force. At the same time, it's on a show called Tittity Bumpity, which is like basically t what TikTok is, mindless garbage. Like I said in the earlier part of tonight's broadcast, those of us who grew up with this stuff, at the time we were paying attention. I know I was. I know when I watched those shows. Now you had like your sort of American type space show, Book Rogers in the 21st Century, the old Battlestar Galactica, Star Wars, you know, which is a kibbutz in space, the Star Trek, which is like a Western in space. That it was always kind of hopeful, that it was about like you know it's the American dream extended into into the cosmos. I never related to any of that. I never. I watched. I mean, I was. I was into. I, ne I haven't even seen a Star Wars film. No, even as a kid, no interest. And I understand why they're popular and entertaining, and you know. But I watched those things, like Battlestar, and mm, mm, mm. they did nothing for me. Even V was entertaining, but it didn't make me go, "Oh wow, maybe those, those that they're, they're they're these alien these lizards are on the earth pretending to be." And I'm like, yeah, whatever. But yet, the British dystopian sci-fi, and when I got older and discovering the previous American stuff with Lovecraft, the, you know, the British so, so the I would watch Star Trek and go, "Yeah, it's, you know, it's basically bonanza in space." You know, you get the Kirk kisses the girl, has a gunfight at the kind of like cosmic okay creal, okay corral, and then it all ends with a happy ending. And that was to me was like very American, and you know very kind of superficial. 
But then you'd see things on British television like Alternative 3, like Quatermass, like Tripods, like The Tomorrow People, like the darker elements of Doctor Who during the Tom Baker years and John Pertwee years. Like the, you know, when Terry Nation was writing the stories, he wrote another word, Blake Seven, another one. They did appeal to me. They did appeal to me because, you know, uh, as shocked as we were as kids with the final episode of Blake Seven, when they were all killed, it would be like the Star Trek Enterprise and they would like basically Spock and, and Kirk and the rest of them slaughtered at the end. That was a more satisfying end because it told us the reality of the world, where Americans were brought up to believe that, you know, in space, it was cowboys in space, and they'd shoot up at the aliens, but they'd always win because they were, they were the good guys, you know, the heroes, the chaps. But, like, the British dystopia was like, you know, yeah, you might win a few battles, but you'll be consumed by the, by an, an alien beast or interplanetary force like the Federation. You know, the the Master and Doctor Who might eventually get you. The The uh, Davros and the Daleks are always coming back. And that's and that left such a deep impression on people like me growing up. Very, very deep impression. And a very valuable and worthy impression growing up. Because I didn't have these blinkered, starry-eyed things. You know, I, I knew something funny had happened on Apollo. I always knew that they encountered something fun, fucked up up there. Uh, I always knew that those they were, weren't telling us the truth of what was happening in space, especially in the 80s when I saw the, the NASA video, the tether, and those what looked like jellyfish swarming around it. That was like, wow, you know. And uh, I looked into the Apollo hoax, and I have to say, at, at Superfish at the first level, it seemed very plausible that they faked it. But then I really dived into the into the what was claimed to be proof of the hoaxes and it wasn't it what just wasn't it fell apart it was what they said went there but they then i realized later on true things like capricorn one and true things like the internet and this sort of stuff uh, as well as like you know people just running with it for conspiracy theory reasons that the the hoax was almost certainly a distraction from what really took place up there in fact i know it was i'm convinced of it. no one could convince me otherwise at this point no one could convince me otherwise of what happened. So, some shit went down up there. And, you know, it's easier if you're a Christian. You know, that's another thing, too. There was the, the, you know, they always used to say when I was growing up, if they discovered aliens from another world, what would religion do? How would the, the religions of the world handle them? And this kind of thing. Well, we're now we're seeing how they're handling it. We're pretending that it never happened. Because there's a, a huge... There's a huge psyop in keeping the population innocent and childlike. And this is why they put children like, you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson and Brian Cox out there. They're, they're very infantile, they're very childlike. And they give us a childlike view of science uh, that suits this concept of, like, everything's all fairy tale. You know, if you look at, like, really Brian Cox and... Neil deGrasse Tyson they're really children's TV presenters being 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 farmed off as you know great scientific minds appealing in a very infantile way uh, to the, the the masses you know in a very patronizing and condescending way uh, and it's the same like we discovered the same thing with Richard At with Atten the Attenboroughs and the the wildlife documentaries, you know, like all the BBC, the noble lion must slay the zebra for the, you know, because this is the, this is the, the law of the jungle. The, the strong eat the poor and, you know, natural selection and all this kind of shite. As you see some poor gazelle being ripped asunder by, you know, a lion, the lioness or something like that. And you grow up thinking, well, that's how it is. And then the internet comes along and you see the most remarkable videos like, you know, crocodiles and water buffalo teaming up to murder a, bang -gang of, a, a gang of lions where the, the water buffalo surround the lions and drive them into the water like a battle plan strategy where the crocodiles devour them. You know, this kind of thing. Or I, I saw a video recently of a gecko who was being attacked 
by a snake. And it's another gecko was going down and beating the snake up, beating the snake off his gecko friend. This is not supposed, this was never shown to us. There's, a, there's videos of gazelles killing cheetahs in, in rivers, drowning them uh, in, in this kind of thing. This notion that it was all like these these videos with no lion. This is why the aristocrats no lion, you know, associate with lions and stuff because it it it, it plays up with their thing of like being ahead of the pack. You know, they're eating us. You know, but they've now discovered that they are since then are being you know are nothing. They're like the Aztecs. They're like you know Montezuma. They now know that there's a greater force. They're like the Aztecs seeing the Spanish galleons on the on the horizon, that they've got that in the seventies with the Spat Martian and Venus space probes, and the other things they've come into contact through God knows where else. And one thing that a higher predatory system it's so funny, you know, it, you look at what happened with the Aztecs, right? In the decades prior to their their annihilation by the Spaniards. Uh, they were they they knew there was a kind of like they were in trouble, and they started killing more and more prisoners of war, mostly Mayans and other Aztec groups. And as cutting the hearts out, you know you know the story. That stuff is true, by the way. In trying to offset it, they tried to basically could the more they killed, the more safer they were. Now, what does that remind you of today? The same thing. Ever since. Ever since they discovered in space, there's, there's, there's a forces out there that are above the aristocrats on Earth. What have they been doing? A depopulation. What did that guy at the Area 54 call say to, Alec, to Art Bell back in the day? They're going to depopulate the major centers. The transubstantiation of the sacred needlecraft. You know, even things like they show this, they're like, the new, a new one came out this week through the climate change thing, which is all about the population, that human beings breathing is destroying the world. Like, how many ways have they been telling the masses, we're removing you, you're going? We're all being dragged, not all of us, those of us in the tribes who opted out, but the, the normies and the NPCs are all being dragged to the top of the Pyramid of the Sun to have their hearts cut out. It's just being done with, you know, the, the prickly pear and whatever other way they can do. I was even wondering about, like, a, you know, automatic locks on car doors. Basically, you're driving a coffin if there's an accident and you go into a river or something. You know, you know, they they are they depopulate and the sterilization, the infertility rates collapsing everywhere. It's all come true. So we're on the cusp of something that will blow our minds when it comes and happens and sees it. And those of us are ready for it. But I, I you know, I always found felt that blue beam was plausible, but now something tells me that blue beam has been binned. That maybe for years they were going to fake it. The, the alien invasion or the a god thing or something but some I have a feeling now that blue beam has been binned blue beam has been binned and it's almost like they don't care they're just going straight for the kill now you know it, they don't care they have their social media they have their AI they have it all so they don't need to be that crude anymore uh, I just I think the 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 window of opportunity for blue beam has come and gone. They don't care. They're not interested anymore. They know there's something happening. It's almost like they're trying to appease uh, the outer gods. And literally, this is why you should be reading your Lovecraft. The outer gods appeasing them, so they will have a special place when we are absorbed into whatever that thing is. But they won't be. They won't be. They were, the, the, the Aztec royalty were given no special place by the Spanish. In fact, quite the opposite. And so they've every they got you know this everything we you know we've learned in recent years, you know, like how the, the natural world is not uh, is far more nuanced in terms of how animals prey, live, survive, fight, 
uh, and the predator thing is not hard and cold like they make it out to be and the same thing with the space thing it's far more nuanced than it's a scam and and i and i actually, i do believe that the that the this this thing this event this 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 greater cosmic force that's not good for us is why you have the people in the truth movement have renfielded as flat earthers. The flat earth thing is a renfielding thing. They're trying to create order on their own kind of order out of chaos on the earth by saying, oh, we're not a sphere, we're actually flat. And if we're flat, that means the Bible is true and the aliens can't be real. This kind of thing. You see, they always end up with going back to the Bible. So that was one of the stories this year that stuck with me. Even though it was limited in information, it kind of, you know, your whole life is, you know, this is the whole thing. You can't be locked into one strict belief. You can have, you can have a floating, you know, a floating miasma of theories that eventually something happens which goes, bam, that solidifies it. That kind of thing. And that solidified my beliefs of like, there was something to Alternative 3. There was something to Quatermass 4. And the Russians have just told us. And there was also, that was also the reason why the Americans and the West in general play down the success of the Russian space program in the 70s. By making it sound like they failed because they never got like, you know, some guy called Wojtek on the moon. You know, the, the, the Russians were like, okay, that's done. The Americans have done it. So let's go off and do something else. And what they did was so astounding to them, it threw them off into, you know, it threw them off into a kind of a psychic deterioration. So I have no doubt that we're about to, we will see things maybe even starting next year. Reality has already been turned upside down, right? Or And everyone's going, what the fuck is going on? I think 2024 and beyond. You know, it, it, following on from the Joe Rogan broadcast, we're going to we're going to get those answers, and they'll even be even more stranger. And the world and reality will like. I mean, look at this week; these bizarre rainbow clouds appearing everywhere. You know, I know those things have existed, but everywhere at the same time, all over the world. You know, it's very very peculiar. The, the, it's like yeah, reality is is up for grabs. Reality is arbitrary. Reality is is going to hit us with surprises. And I'll say this to you all. Uh, be lucky that you're around uh, to see this. Because that's exactly how I feel. Just to remind you that the next episode of Hocus Focus will be on Serum on the Anish channel, Wuthering Nights. And that will be broadcast January 21st. So it's a bit of a long gap between now and then, but she needs it, I need it, and uh, life gets in the way as usual. But it'll be, you know, it'll be, it'll be worth waiting. It's it's really bizarre. Like I ask myself, where in this process are we? How close to being in a dystopian sci-fi movie are we? How dark is it have the establishment lost control of ai i was watching something on joe rogan recently and a guy was saying that chat gpt chat gpt that's no that's the most basic bottom line you know consumer version of it. so this thing is, is practically sentient at this point now the ai thing <laughs> It is literally in the hands of devils. Literally. And the biggest devil of them all, Jeffrey Epstein. Now, we're supposed to be getting a subpoena now regarding sealed envelopes with names on them. And one of the things they're doing is they're having people overly excited about it. And they're also having people concentrating far too much on the pedo aspects of it, on the nonces, the famous nonces. And everybody is sort of wetting their whistles, jumping up and down, waiting for the names of famous nonces to be published. I started to think this is a red herring. 
and I'll tell you why. Yeah, that stuff went on. That's all true. What they don't, what they want, what they want you to really, you know, you know, not concentrate on, is Epstein just wasn't a pimp for the establish, a pedo pimp for the establishment. That was only one side of his gig. The other side of his gig was he was heavily involved in artificial intelligence. Now, now Epstein is like something from. Like a sci a sci fi film, like a James Bond baddie, literally. Now, a lot of the truthers out there, anyone who has a photograph that's seen with somebody standing beside Epstein, they automatically think, paint up well, paint up well, well. No, no. These guys, was, Epstein was a mover and shaker, a smoozer. So he made sure he had his photograph taken with everybody. I've got half the people he had his photo, the celebrities and famous people that had the photographs taken with him. Probably don't even remember meeting him. That's what those like establishment parties are like. So don't get hung up on that stuff. If you want to really get hung up on the Epstein thing, forget about the list of people going to the island. Although that's important, it'll never come out. If there's anyone of any importance on that, the name will be redacted, and you know that. What we really need to know is why he was the why he is the AI man for the deep state. Epstein has been working with people at Disney, big shots at Disney, regarding AI. And that should, if that doesn't set off your alarm bells, nothing will. He set up a company in the U.S. Virgin Islands that was called Southern Trust. And he set it up with tens of millions of dollars that are pushed into his hand to buy the Rothschild Bank. Epstein spent much of his money to hire science, science advisors, particularly from MIT, which is how he got into contact with Chomsky. Now, MIT is, works very closely with the military and DARPA. Now, why is it a sex trafficking pedophile blackmailer like Epstein have an interest in science? And more importantly, how was he still able to procure these enormous loans from the likes of the Rothschild Bank and others, and also the help of the U.S. Virgin Island government after he'd been convicted, convicted for sex trafficking back in 2012? He is also heavily involved in Africa, particularly in Ethiopian Somalia, where he basically sits down with legislators and rewrites the law so he can implant microchips into children for data harvesting. This is like this is like Frankenstein stuff. As I said, the company he call he started in the Virgin Islands was called Southern Trust, and it was very much obsessed with genomes. In fact, it's been called the Google of the genome or the biomedical gene biomedical Google. And what they were doing was taking children after specific profiling, i.e. poor children or children from orphanages, children with no like strong families. So remember, that's many of the parents in the world today following the needle craft who willingly allow their own children to be injected with an experimental DNA treatment. But Epstein and his backers in the Rothschild Bank looked for kids with autism from marginalized communities that wouldn't be missed. He was basically Joseph Mengele with a hedge fund. And we still don't know what he was doing down there. Every now and again, we get an insight into just how dark it is. And it has us questioning, are these people humans that are running the world or in, and in, in positions of power? And if like that Area 51 call, are they interacting with the establishment. So that Jeffrey Epstein thing was I'm talking about the, the bio the bio the biomedical aspects of it, the AI aspects of it. That's an insight into uh, these people. That's that's a look inside their their rotten souls. There's other things too that show give us hints now and again of 
the high strangers. Do you remember the politician in America who was saying the speech? And right behind her was this woman who was like a speechwriter or a PR person who was mouthing the precise same words at the precise same time and looked staring at the back of this woman's head. And she had like a glazed over spaced out look in her in her eyes. And when she looked like an alien being, she looked like an alien being who was transmitting thoughts into this politician's skull and was melting them and she you know she was melting them too like a ventriloquist dummy and then when she noticed the camera was on her she suddenly panicked looked down and stopped doing it who are these people what are these people again we're given an insight an accidental window opens and we see them for what they are Another famous one, infamous one, that I just can't get out of my head since I saw it, was at George Bush Sr.'s funeral, and during the the ceremony, whatever you want to call it, mass, envelopes were handed out to certain people in the, in the pews, including the likes of Hillary Clinton and a few others. And I'll never forget the looks on their faces when they opened them. Laura Bush took the envelope out and showed it to Jeb Bush. And Jeb Bush looked like he'd just been told that it's over. Whatever he wanted was, whatever he thought he was going to get, maybe his throne in the White House, whatever, or some. But he, he, he went into a state of shock and panic. Laura Bush went spaced out and stared at the distance. And Bush Jr. just looked at her and said, I know, and then looked away, pretending he didn't see it. What was most telling about that of all was that also Biden and his wife looked at the envelope, and they literally looked up at the camera to see that they didn't make the wrong look, and they did, if shock and surprise. But the one that always stays strangest of all in that event to me was the way Hillary Clinton opened the envelope and looked at it and said, mm, whatever, that was literally her body language. Hmm, whatever. What was, what was in that letter from George Bush Sr. to this select group? Was it an admission that he was behind the JFK assassination? I kind of doubt that. That wouldn't have affected Jeb Bush Jr. the way it did. It was almost like he was saying it's over. And everything has raced through my head from they were told that there was an asteroid coming to we're ending the government, we're ending the US. The US is ending now. And there will be no job for you, Jeb, in the White House. Biden will be the last president. This kind of thing. The door opens and we're given a look in. And as there's days I wonder if this is a chaos magic thing, or is it something real, or is it something I'm reading too much into, but we're living in the strangest of times, and that's why I think 2024 will be an amazing year of reveal, and something tells me we in the tribes will be fine, we'll manage fine, for no other reason than we're ready for it. Naturally, the needlecraft will take a colossal total total more i saw that one million have died from the needlecraft in britain since 2021 extra and with the viral load and the viral season coming in march april we can expect those numbers to skyrocket again they got their population decrease they got their fertility collapse for the west but we'll be okay we'll be fine like i said we get we also get openings now and again that reassure people like us. One, there's a document on the World Economic Forum where it states that people who can think for themselves, they want to keep people who will reject um, things out of hand after they've thought about them rather than just blindly accepting them. They'll keep, and that's us. It's almost like the needlecraft or the prickly pear was put out there to 
to separate us as the kind of elite? Wouldn't that be a turn up for the books? You go on a group like I, I, I fucking love science, and you see how the whole thing. The, two years ago, on that group, they they would have given the SS a run for their money. Literally, it was all there. Take they were saying things like if anyone refuses the prickly pear, take their children off them, uh, contact their landlords and have them thrown out on the street, stop them from getting bank loans and mortgage lending from mortgage lending agencies and things like that. And uh, that was those that was just the base of it. Everything the other things were like you know, refuse the medical care if they show up in a hospital or the classic uh, take away their jobs, no life. And now, I go over, now and again I will go into that group and taunt them about the whole suddenly and unexpectedly, and there's a wall of silence. You get little insights now and again. I think they know they've been duped and they failed the test. It's going to be okay. It's going to be interesting. It's going to be a challenge. But at the same time, too, I, quite, I feel kind of quite positive about 2024. For people like us in the tribe. And there's another document at the World Economic Forum that talks about how anyone who doesn't want to live in the Great Reset will be left alone. People live in the countryside. And they say things like, well they won't they won't want things like cinemas and multiplexes and IMAXs and bowling alleys, but we don't want that anyway. And also they will need X amount of people in the country to look at countryside and outside the cities to look after it because the establishment, the elites will still want to come out here. So they want somebody, at least a small amount of the population still using the roads and things like that. You have to remember after the needlecraft the majority of the the normies will run into it like they're very happy and your job is not to stop them. Always remember that. You're you're not an evangelical Christian, you don't have to save anybody. You only have to save yourself. So we'll wrap up the show here tonight. I hope you enjoyed this end of year Vaughn. And I'll be back on a lot more regular basis with the Vaughns in 2024. So there's something else to look forward to. So until next time, this is me, Thomas Sheridan, saying look after yourself, take care of yourself, and feck them if they can't take a joke. 2024? Bring it on.